But it's the, the one that really terrifies me is O oh, Christmas Tree. O oh, Christmas Tree. Everybody can th rhyme that song off in their heads, but for me, it just is a black cloud that has followed me for 24 years. That year, which was 1985, I was working for a company that was bouncing its paychecks. And so Christmas had come along and we had two young boys, one was five and one was three, and we wanted to make Christmas as normal as possible for them. And I found a Christmas tree lot that had trees starting at $3.99. Even though this was 1995, that was still one heck of a good price for a Christmas tree. Well, the trees, it turned out, were branches that had been cut off large Douglas fir trees, and someone had gotten the bright idea to sell these branches as trees. And I brought the thing home. Charlie Brown would have left it there. <laughs> I brought it home and tried to put it in the uh, Christmas tree stand. They keep putting water in my vodka bottle. <laughs> Can someone do something about that? <laughs> oh, look at this. Someone's going to do something about that. <laughs> Very good man. A holly jolly cranberry and... Mm-hmm. <laughs> Very good. At any rate, I tried to put this tree into its stand. And I turned the bolts all the way in, and none of them met wood. And in my calm, quiet manner, I hammered some two by fours that I had laying around, around the bottom of the tree, and screwed the bolts into those. Well, the next day was Brad's three-year-old preschool Christmas pageant. And we went. My wife is a very smart woman. She had something else to do that day. <laughs> and so I was left to sit in the audience with my five-year-old while my three-year-old performed in his Christmas pageant. And they were all to sing a chorus of we with you a Merry Christmas, and uh, uh, all of the, the kids' Christmas carols. And it was in a church basement, which even made things worse. The, uh, the children were supposed to sing a nice little song and dance routine that the teacher had written. And they all put a pretend axe over their shoulder and marched around the stage. And they all pretended to chop down a Christmas tree. And they put their pretend axe over their shoulder again and they put the trunk of their tree over the, the other shoulder and they marched around the stage home. And they all got down on their knees and put their tree in its stand. And they all got up and put the lights around their tree Brad was still on his knees. They all got up and put the ornaments on their tree. Brad was still on his knees. They put the star on top. They put the tinsel on the tree. And Brad was still on his knees. And just as the other children were about to put the, their pretend presents under their pretend Christmas tweez, Brad turned to the audience and said in a voice that could be heard throughout the room and by all the ships at sea, I can't get this freaking tree in the freaking stand. <laughs> Except the word he used wasn't freaking. <laughs> Now, as I told you, I was sitting in the audience at this point, trying desperately to pretend, I wonder whose kid that is. 
But I brought his brother along who stood on his chair and said, is Brad going to get in trouble for saying freaking tree, Dad? <laughs> he, he didn't use the word freaking either. <laughs> How come you called our tree a freaking tree yesterday, Dad? <laughs> Why do you have your head between your, head, your knees, Dad? So when I got home, Diane arrived home, and Mike had the entire story of what had happened told to her before she could get her coat hung up. And Diane gave me one of those looks that wives, I'm sure, must learn at their mother's knees. And it really told me on which one of Santa's lists I was going to find myself. Just my freaking luck. <laughs> and the third carol that brings about a disaster was the Christmas song by Nat King Cole that starts, chestnuts roasting on an open fire. My father decided that he would like to surprise my mother because she loved that carol. When it first came out, my mother absolutely loved Nat King Cole and particularly when he would sing that carol. She thought it was much better than when Mel Torme did it. But Dad decided to buy some chestnuts, not thinking about the fact that in our home we were devoid of an open fire. <laughs> but he was inventive. He snuck the chestnuts onto a cookie sheet, and the oven was already hot because the turkey was in there, and he slipped the chestnuts into the oven. No one told my father that you're supposed to poke holes through the shells. And when the first chestnut exploded, sounding somewhat like a shotgun going off, my father ran to the kitchen, followed by my mother, my maiden aunt, and all three of us kids. And by the time we got there, there had been eight or nine other explosions, and black smoke was starting to erupt from the, the oven. And all Dad could do was hold the oven door closed while he counted 28, 29, 30, 31. When he got to 36, he thought he was safe, but he'd lost count. And he opened the door, and an incendiary chestnut went across the kitchen and crashed into the, the kitchen window, narrowly missing my maiden aunt who never forgave him for the rest of her life. And the turkey looked like it had landed on the beaches of Normandy. <laughs> Foil was inserted into the meat. One wing and leg was hanging loose at its side. My mother was crying. My father was trying to explain that he was trying to do something nice for her. But as we all know, if a man speaks in the forest and there's no one there to hear him, he's still wrong. <laughs> the only good thing about that event was when the turkey was brought to the table, my mother had sliced it in the kitchen ahead of time rather than the performance that normally went on in our home at Thanksgivings and turkey and, and Christmases and Turkey was on sale, so I bought one days. And remember that maiden aunt that masticated a hundred times? Well, when she hit a filling with tin foil, all three of us kids passed things through our noses, and we decided to give the points to our father. 